try it again. Let's get some energy. Good morning. Excellent. It's a beautiful day. I'm in a fabulous panel. Well, you know, rain is beautiful, right? So I work with farmers, so we need rain. <laughs> um, so it's a beautiful day. So, um, so this panel today um, is on food, uh, urban ag and food policy. Um, and it's very exciting to me. Sorry, let me say my name is Dara Cooper and my bio's in there. It's very exciting to me um, because I've done and continue to do um, a lot of work around the country with amazing groups, um, including the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, Heal Food Alliance, um, and Cooperation Jackson. I just want to lift that up <laughs> because the work in uh, Jackson, Mississippi, for example, are folks doing incredible work around urban ag and food policy that I think we need to lift up. Um, and they're doing work around worker-owned co-ops, building solidarity economies. And so we heard a lot of, you know, a lot of really uh, major issues around disparities. Uh, but I want to lift up a lot of exciting solutions that are happening around the country. Um, uh, communities are organizing and addressing power imbalance, some root causes related to a lot of what we just heard, too. Uh, cities are growing food policy councils and a host of exciting solutions. So um, especially the cities that we're hearing from today that I'm very excited about. So my second hometown of Detroit we get to hear from. Whoop, whoop. <laughs> um, and I spent a lot of time in Detroit with, with folks like the, uh, the Detroit Black Community Food Security Network and um, a lot of folks, uh, Food Lab, shout out to them as well, where we have folks um, at the DBCFN um, working on building food co-ops. But today from Detroit, we get to hear from Ashley Atkinson, who is the co-director of Keep Growing Detroit. Again, you can see her bio in um, the program. So we also get to hear from my hometown, Chicago, which I'm very excited about. I didn't realize you were from Chicago, too. So shout out to Shy City, which I'm, I'm from, um, from with, um, and we have Joan, um, Hopkins here, who's the co uh, project coordinator and also youth participant of Windy City um, uh, Harvest Corps. Yes? No? Okay. No. Who's the project? She'll clear I'll that up. It. It's yeah. all good. <laughs> <laughs> She's with uh, Windy City Harvest out of Chicago. Um, and then also so much as we know is happening um, in Baltimore. And so we're really excited to hear um, from Holly, um, excuse me, Holly Freshtat, the Baltimore um, City Food Policy Director. Um, and so we're going to go in that order. And so please, like, give them some energy, clap it up really loudly, and let them know that you're really excited to hear them. And so welcome to the mic. Yeah, Ashley. Um, Good morning, everybody. Um, I am so happy to be here to support my friend um, and to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in Detroit. Um, I would definitely like to, to say and start by um, that the work that we're doing in Detroit related to food systems and, and particularly food um, and agriculture is very, very uh, collaborative um, and it's got a really long and deep history. Uh, we were actually the first in the country to start growing food in the city during an um, uh, economic um, crisis in the 1890s. Um, and uh, ever since that point, there's been people growing food in the city um, and we are, um, are lucky to, to kind of carry on that legacy. Um, there are a lot of people involved and in, um, you know, we're, we're just keep growing Detroit. Um, so I wanted to share our mission uh, to promote a food sovereign city where the majority of fruits and vegetables that Detroiters consume are grown within the city limits by Detroiters for Detroiters, which is you know, a little audacious, but 100% um, um, achievable because if you're not aware, the city of Detroit has over 40 square miles of vacant land. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, we're really poised to figure out how do we take that idea and turn it into a reality. And really it starts um, by helping people grow food wherever they're at. Um, so our organization prides itself on doing a lot of listening, um, and when we listen to uh, residents uh, and, and ask, you know, what's, what's preventing you from growing your own food, if you want to grow your own food, a lot of times it starts with the resources. So the seeds, the transplants, the compost, the wood chips, all the things that you need in order to start a garden and farm. Um, and so our organization um, has set out to both listen to what exact seeds, compost, uh, transplants people need, 
and then also to build the infrastructure to provide for ourselves within the city limits, right, food sovereignty. So we um, have built over actually 50 uh, solar passive or um, heated greenhouses in the city, and we grow 100% of the transplants that we're distributing, um, over 250,000 transplants in the city, um, training Detroit residents to care for them, um, to manage those greenhouses. Um, and this is the um, greenhouse and the farm that we operate uh, where about half of those transplants are grown. Um, we're also careful about the, the seeds we source, um, uh, the seeds we grow, the, the, material, the other materials that you know, are, are making up our resources. Uh, this is uh, what's called music variety of garlic. We've been growing um, music in the city. We're providing 100% of our garlic seed and, and some other seed, um, and we're on our way to provide more and more of our own seed. Um, and we believe that this could be called Motown music because it's been in Detroit soil for so long. So all of these resources go out into the community um, in really lovely distribution days. Um, I'm gonna quote one of the um, uh, gardeners from just actually in April last month. Um, they said, cold crop distribution is my second favorite day of the year. And um, they were so excited to be there. And I said, well, what's your first day of the year, favorite day of the year? And I was thinking like, it's gotta be a family holiday. And, and they said, hot crop distribution. <laughs> Um, you know, they're like these really lovely days that people look forward to to kind of see each other as much as to, to get resources and start the growing season. But it can be kind of daunting because we're distributing over 70 varieties of fruits and vegetables. Most people know how to grow five, maybe 10 varieties of fruits and vegetables. Um, you know, when you get to 70, a lot of it you don't even know, how do I harvest this? How do I eat this? You know, what do I pair it with? Um, and so once people are you know, growing, they're in their gardens, they have the things that they need. Um, it's all about wrapping uh, social supports and education supports around everybody um, so that uh, when people hit a wall, you know, they, they don't know the difference between curly kale and dinosaur kale, or they're not quite sure um, how to prepare, you know, ground cherries or, you know, any number of things, that there is an accessible place where they can learn you know, what they need to get through that wall. And, uh, and much like with the resources, we're listening a lot to gardeners to understand both what they need right now to, to kind of um, be successful in their gardens, but what they're interested in learning in the future, right? Where, where they wanna take their garden, whether they wanna try aquaponics or ver vermicomposting, or they wanna use a broad fork or any other thing, you know, that we'd never heard before that we have to, you know, learn how to do and bring to the community. So this is an example of, this is actually one of my favorite pictures. I, I think it really um, embodies a lot of what we're trying to do. Um, it's in a community setting. It's very, you know, inspiring. When you look around this picture, you don't exactly know who's in charge. Um, you don't know who's teaching. You don't know, like, um, is it is it during the lesson or people are eating and smiling. It's really diverse. Um, and, and this is what we really strive for in every single um, uh, class or, or community event that we put together, which are hundreds every year, um, to get people um, uh, they're inspired, and usually it's a community resident that is teaching the class. Um, uh, they have amazing skills, maybe never have taught a class before, so that's where our organization comes in. We help them kind of get ready for, for teaching the class. Um, and uh, the information is hands-on, very accessible, um, and, and the most important thing is it's social. People are meeting each other and kind of developing relationships, which are really, really important. Those are carried over um, in shared work days. Um, we do a lot of volunteer events and shared work days to, to get people, um, uh, to get their gardens built first and foremost, but also to expand gardens or to get in front of some of the summer maintenance that kind of tends to be overwhelming. The vast majority of the gardens that we work with are communally operated, usually by one or two people are kind of holding the load of the work, and it's really, really, um, you know, it's a it's kind of a fragile environment. We need to um, be supportive as, as much as possible. We also do a lot of eating together, a lot of dancing together, a lot of playing together. Um, again, it's all about building those relationships. And then also um, trying to make uh, sure that resources are not only available, you know, at the point where gardens get started, but tool banks and compost and things that people need throughout the season are available um, in their neighborhoods. So we have a bunch of regional resource centers where, gr where growers, they're all hosted by some of the most advanced um, 
inspirational garden centers in, in the community. They're, um, they're hosted there, and then gardeners from that neighborhood can go over to the resource center and you know, continue to get the, the resources and, and, um, and the advice that they need to kind of sus sustain themselves over the, the season. And it's working, absolutely. Um, Detroiters grow amazing food. Um, and uh, they're, um, in about 2007 was uh, the, the, again, listening to, to, to the residents, um, the desire to, um, to bring that food, at least a portion of it, to market. We this was, 2007 is when the, food, the Detroit Food Desert Study came out. And, we, and when we started to hear about ourselves being a food desert, which we, um, we, we reject at this point um, pretty wholeheartedly. Um, but um, we were starting to hear all of these things about ourselves, about how our neighbors, um, how we didn't have access to fruits and vegetables. And so it was really important, first and foremost, for Detroiters who were growing this beautiful food to be a part of the solution. And, and so we started to sell at uh, neighborhood farmers markets. Um, and now we have um, a cooperative, a little C cooperative, with about 70 of those um, gardens that we support who bring a little, sometimes a lot, to market. Um, we put it all together under the banner of, of Grown in Detroit. And we're selling to two weekly farmers markets, Eastern Market on Saturday, Eastern Market on Tuesday, and then also to about 30 restaurants, and 100% of the profits go to the um, the growers that bring the product. So not only is it um, a part of being part of the solution to bring access to the neighborhood, it's um, providing really important supplemental income to, to the growers that we serve. So does this work? In 2003, this program, you know, that's providing the garden resources and support um, served a, a network um, that actually was uh, it, it was a long-standing network called the Detroit Agriculture Network, uh, where there were about 80 networked gardens, and these were the community gardens that were networked. Um, and in 2015, we had uh, well over 1,400 gardens in the uh, in the Garden Resource Program. And then you'll see this uh, this fifth category, which is I can't read it garden. Um, basically, they've grown out of the Garden Resource Program. So they don't need the seeds and plants and resources that, you know, that the general membership um, provides, but they're still part of the community. And that's, isn't that kind of the point of, of our jobs, is to grow ourselves out of, uh, out of a job? Um, I was really proud the other day. I was in a, um, in a meeting where, where some of the, the groups that support youth um, in the community, uh, we, we call it Youth Growing Detroit, um, they were they were they were doing this big round table where they were explaining to other growers, you know, what they were doing for the summer, and um, the work that they were doing in and of itself was totally amazing. And our work was kind of way back in the background, like we got started because of, or we're able to do this because of, or we met this person because of. We're way in the background, but you know, we're there and we're helping to support everybody kind of grow and do their own thing. That's what we do. Um, so. You know, what is the effect? In addition to over 1,400 networked gardens in the city of Detroit with 20,000 people involved, um, we know that gardeners and farmers are, um, are actually, they have more access to fruits and vegetables and they're eating more fruits and vegetables. So uh, we did a study a number of years ago and gardeners um, were eating 2.5 servings of fruits and vegetables more per day than non-gardeners in the same zip code. So there's real you know, health status change um, uh, happening. Um, I, I like to tell everybody that I meet this, um, that most preferences with fruits and vegetables um, are established by age three. So in our, in our programs, we have over 30 early childhood center gardens where we're reaching thousands of zero to five-year-olds, and we're helping also not only to have um, gardens at early childhood centers, but to have gardens at the homes of, of the families with uh, young children. Um, because if we can if we can change the you know the access and the you know and the and the consumption of fruits and vegetables in the family when the, when the kid is that little, then it'll it'll last their entire life. And so it's so important. Um, the other thing that we find. Um, which we don't like to tell people this because we're not quite sure what will happen as a result. But people engaged in the work um, are, are experiencing something that we're, we don't necessarily know what to call it yet, but food consciousness, like extreme change in wh how they feel about food, how, how they purchase food, um, what kind of uh, advocacy they're willing to do related to food. Um, and one of the things um, that we're finding is that they're way more um, willing to support 
uh, uh, local and organic um, producers, but particularly urban farmers and gardeners, which, you know, if we go back to grown in Detroit and, you know, those farmers bringing things to market, that's extremely important, right? Um, I like I like this photo because it's the circle, right? It's the little it's the little kids that are starting to eat fruits and vegetables more and more and more with their families. Um, and this was actually something we didn't plan, but this farmer was bringing his product to sell to a restaurant. We aggregate for restaurants. So the farmer just like walks by a tour of little kids with carrots and they mob them and they're like, ah, carrots. You know, um, so they're really, really exciting. Um, and the, um, the other great thing is uh, there are, it's a real change in the city of Detroit. There are now 13 neighborhood-based farmers markets and produce outlets. Back five years ago, there was just one or two, right? So there are lots of urban farmers who are finding a home, a place at these farmers markets, and then lots of Detroiters who are, are now um, uh, more and more, we're trying to figure out how to even grow it, um, accessing fruits and vegetables at farmers markets. You know, then there's Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Um, you know, once your basic needs are provided for, there's also, you know, your your connection to the bigger picture. You know, meaning in life. You know, a lot of gardeners are reporting that um, uh, their their connection, what they're what they're experiencing in the garden, either connection to the natural environment or connection to other pe people, has been really really meaningful. It's a stress reliever. It's therapeutic. Um, so policy, right? That's sort of what we're here to talk about. Um, our organization, um, you know, looks really hard at kind of the big picture and what's happening with, with um, food and agriculture in the city. Um, in 2013, uh, our city adopted an urban agriculture ordinance, um, and we also changed from a, a council, um, a, a general council, um, uh, council at large to council by districts. So we wanted to know um, what was the change in those two years, given those two big changes in garden participation. And what we learned, um, just very briefly, because I'm running out of time, the ranking, um, those, count, those council districts where there was an advocate, saw, we saw, um, we saw um, greater participation in gardens in that district. So if you have an advocate in the city council, it does change things. Um, but the urban agriculture ordinance alone didn't necessarily facilitate a, a, a like windfall of new gardens, um, right? So we were able to change a policy to make it not illegal to grow you know food in the city, but it was it was definitely not creating you know and facilitating an environment where we're encouraging people to grow food. Um, another thing that's happening in the city, um, uh, Dara did mention Food Lab, they're our sister organization. There's an amazing um, creative group, group of uh, local entrepreneurs in the city um, turning family recipes and, and you know, uh, inspired ideas about food into um, restaurants, catering business, pop-up restaurants, uh, food trucks, value-added products. Um, and uh, it's the community as such as that these people are connected to the growers, right? And and they're able to, you know, create whole grown and made in Detroit products, which, you know, is amazing. But then there's uh, a lot, a long way to go. There's huge barriers to getting into a kitchen, to, um, you know, getting licensed. There's just enormous barriers. And when you look at this report, the economic um, uh, analysis of Detroit food system that our Detroit Food Policy Council produced, you see that there is enormous potential to um, create jobs and economic opportunities for Detroiters related to food that we're just not capturing because it's not, again, a facilitative environment in the city. I just, I can't share that statistic, but I would like to share a statistic with you later. Um, and then there's there's land. Um, so right now there are about 165 acres under cultivation with those 1,400 plus gardens. Um, and going back to our original mission, a food sovereign city, uh, um, 5,000 acres or as many acres as are under cultivation for parks in the city of Detroit would help us produce 70% of the, the vegetables that we that we consume in the city and over 40% of the fruit. So on just 5,000 acres in the city, which is you know 25% uh, of just the vacant land that's there right now and growing, um, we could actually be feeding ourselves and gaining all of that economic opportunity. Um, yet we are in an, envir in an environment where if you're a billionaire, millionaire, you're able to get you know, 2,000 acres of land in the city. Um, I won't name names, but there is a project that's a reality. Um, but if you're an average citizen, um, you are not able um, to really uh, buy land for agriculture um, in, in the city. It's very, very difficult. So I wanted to end on this slide um, because they started to um, shut off water again in, in the city this Monday. Um, 
and um, it, it's a reminder that um, uh, that policy at its best, uh, you know, creates an environment where th where people are treated equally. Um, but something that it took me way longer to learn than it should have is that what is equal is not fair, and what is fair is not equal. And you know, in order to make sure that we're headed in the direction of fair and not just equal, um, we need to have community relationships. We need to have trusted relationships. We need to have each other. Um, and uh, gardens are a great place to know one another and to build those relationships. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Holly Freistadt, Food Policy Director for Baltimore City. Just give me one second to pull my slide. Okay, it's always easier to talk when you have fruits and vegetables in the background. Okay, so I'm Holly Freistadt. I'll start over. Food Policy Director for Baltimore City. And I want to start with giving you a quick overview. One of our goals is to improve health outcomes by increasing access to healthy, affordable food in Baltimore City's food deserts. What's important to understand is that food is now part of the city's planning process. You know, this is part of the Food Policy Task Force recommendations from 2009. But at the same time, in 2009, we launched our sustainability plan, which has established Baltimore as a leader in local sustainable food systems. So yes, we're looking at health and equity, but we're also looking how is it embedded into the larger food system itself. So food does not fit into any one government agency, nor should it. Um, if you put it into health, Department of Health, then you only look at health outcomes. If you put it into economic development, you only look at economic development. So in 2010, we established a Baltimore Food Policy Initiative, intergovernmental collaboration between the Department of Health, Department of Planning, Office of Sustainability, and the Baltimore Development Corporation. And we all are addressing these issues of food access, health equity, and local food systems from our own agency perspective. Um, government is, can, but government should and should not be, sorry. Um, government has a role in food access, but it should not be doing it alone. And so we have the Food Policy Advisory Committee. And the goal of this, it's not a formal council. There's no politics involved with it. Um, and it's 55 organizations and growing now. And the goal is break down silos. It's pretty simple. If you're doing anything in food in the city and you represent an organization, we want you at the table. Um, and it's really looking at what is a collective impact? Who's doing what? How can we do it better? And how do we work together? It's not necessarily setting the agendas and having consensus. It's about getting the work done and knowing who's doing what. Um, in a few minutes, I'll talk a little bit more about the neighborhood food advocates and the resident side of the work. But this is more representing organizations, whether it's government, nonprofits, academic institutions. So this is a really crazy slide, but I want to put it up there, is six years ago, we had four government agencies. Actually, just so you know, when I started, there was myself at part time, you know, in the Department of Planning, and then we got the Health Department, so then there was like two allies going on, um, and then we got four allies or four agency, you know, key agencies. All right, 12 government agencies all working together on food. Um, and what's interesting with this slide, and there's a lot to see here, is that the first thing I did was started asset mapping our city. Um, in order for to do effective food policy, you need to know who's doing what and how does it impact the food system. So we started to look at the mayor's org chart and we started to look at all the different divisions. And then I started to put little you know, words. Oh, you know, housing is in charge of all the summer meal contracts for the entire city. Oh, interesting. You know, um, planning, oh, we're doing the, you know, urban agriculture, public markets, you know, well, that's part of the city as well. You know, that's actually where we had a lot of food swamps going on. Um, you know, our farmer's markets, oh yeah, look, they're run by the city, but they didn't have SNAP at the time. So we started to look at all these different agencies and just started putting key words. You know, the school system, sorry, that makes no sense to you guys, but BCPSS, I know that it's not logical to anyone else but me, that is the school system there. So we started to really look at where does food fit into the system. Okay, but we know that good intentions without data doesn't go anywhere. So we work with the um, Johns Hopkins School of Public Health Center for Livable Future, and we have an issued, city-issued food environment map. And when I first got here, the map was this really pretty purple. And I looked at it, 
and said, well, you know, we can't have a pretty map. This is a pol policy tool. This is not a community engagement tool, and I want to be really clear here. This is a policy tool. This is a tool to change how government is addressing equity and food access in our city. And you know what? Maps work with electeds. So we have our city issued map. And what we did, and we're very careful, it's not just about supermarkets. It has four key factors, all right? So our definition is looking at distance to a grocery store quarter mile. It's looking at low vehicle availability, which transportation is a huge issue for us. It's looking at poverty, 185% of poverty, but the most important, and please pay attention to this one, low healthy food availability score. Because we partner with a university, they go out every three years and do a healthy food availability score of every food retail establishment in Baltimore City, around 800 of them, and they're scored. When you take all four of those, you end up with your food desert layer, all right? So it's not one factor, it's all four factors. So you could call this a food, I call it a food environment map because I don't want to say it's a food desert because we actually have a density of food swamps as well. It's all encompassed in this. Impact, 25% of Baltimore City residents live in food deserts. 30% of our kids, 25% of our seniors. And you, we need to understand our food environment. 45 supermarkets, 435 corner stores, 300 convenience stores. So 700 plus corner and convenience stores in our city. Okay, so we're here talking about health, so we better look at this through a health perspective. 17 year age difference. We know we were talking about mortality um, and premature deaths. 17 year age difference between the highest income neighborhood and the lowest income neighborhood based on zip code. Um, and then you also see in the chart next door to it is that you look at race. African American residents are disproportionately um, low access to healthy food than any other um, race in the city. So that's all great. We have a nice big map, but how does it get used? So in uh, June, we released uh, council district maps. And you can go on our website and, see, website and see this. And so for every council district, we were able to take the food environment map and go into detail. So it shows every corner store and convenience store on the map. It also shows all the summer meal sites, all, all the after school sites, um, senior eating together sites. So it goes into a lot more detail about the full food environment, not just the food retail. And then it also has, and you can't really see it on this PowerPoint, but it's on our website, we have a one pager on the map and the back side is an explanation of it. You know, how does this district rate to all the other districts? How does it rate to the city? You know, who is disproportionately affected? This one is showing actually that kids, or I think it was kids on this one, that was disproportionately affected. And as we went through and analyzed each of the districts, they were not what we expected, funny enough. Um, so we created a food desert retail strategy. Expand and retain supermarkets. Improve food environment of non-traditional grocery retail. That's all the examples. Corner stores, convenience stores, farmers markets, public markets. There's not any one solution to food access. Supermarkets will not solve this issue. It's a part of the issue, but we gotta look at the full retail perspective. Um, public markets, we also have to look at growing your own food. You know, it is a part of our environment. Um, so we're looking at homegrown Baltimore, I'll talk more about that. You know, farms growing their food, community gardeners, what's the role of homegrown products in our city to feed the city itself? And then also, really looking at developing a food access strategy. So that's a very quick glimpse of the work we do in the food access world. Um, there's so much more, but I don't have time for that today. Um, and I want to now move into the food and farming side of things. Um, oh, you know what? I actually forgot to mention something pretty important. Um, so going back to the city council district maps, we created those maps and met with every district member. Um, and we passed this year a personal property tax credit um, for food desert incentive areas for bringing new grocery stores in the city and also for, important, our existing grocery stores who are currently preventing food deserts, meaning that if they were to go away, we would have a food desert, um, to be able to get a personal property tax credit, meaning everything you shake out of a store. That is a very high rate in Baltimore City, and that's what the grocery store said they really needed. We passed that in three months. We introduced it, it passed, um, and implemented within three months. And I believe that the maps themselves, going back to maps being effective for electeds, it was a very effective tool for that piece. All right, now I'm going into food and farming. Okay, food access programs. Oh, food and farming, food access. So we have the virtual supermarket, which is a community-based 
food access program working with neighborhood food advocates, residents who live in senior and disabled housing facilities. They do online grocery ordering. We have a lot of tech savvy seniors now. And then um, they shop right delivers to the location. We also have a healthy corner store programs, um, which is really looking at high touch, high impact with youth neighborhood food advocates working with cor corner store owners to have healthy food. And then we also have healthy carryouts, understanding that when people are going to carryouts, to help them kind of nudge them to the healthiest options. This is where the food policy piece I was worried that I wasn't telling you about. So I just talked about the personal property tax credit. Um, another issue that we had with our retailers was SNAP disbursement. So that all of SNAP was dispersed in 10-day period. So the grocery stores were really packed for 10 days and not for the rest of the uh, month. So we were able to get that changed. Um, and then also with the virtual supermarket, we bumped into a federal policy barrier that we've been working really collaboratively with, with USDA looking at online SNAP benefits. So shifting gears over to our school district, we have this past year, we moved into community eligibility provision, which was a game changer for the city. So what this means is that every single student, no matter your income, gets free breakfast and free lunch. Our rates of um, eating school meals went up over 20% in less than a year. Um, huge changes in that side of things. We also have this innovative um, farm, Great Kids Farm, where they're growing food, they have a processing facility right on the farm, and then it actually gets processed into grated carrots and beets, beets, yes, and then the mainline distributor comes to the farm, picks it up, and then it goes to the warehousing, and then it goes to all the schools, and it goes to 80 schools. So there's a lot of innovation going on with our school district in getting local produce into the school as well. In the urban ag side of things, um, in 2011, the mayor went to Chicago, actually, for the first and only um, Food Access Summit of Mayors uh, hosted by the White House. And it was Minneapolis who created homegrown Minneapolis. And it was at that time the mayor said, you know what, we don't need to keep you know, repeating ourselves and creating something brand new. Let's just all replicate each other's work. So in that honor, we have homegrown Baltimore, looking at grow local, buy local, eat local. Um, so in the, in the policy side of things, we have an urban ag tax credit, and that's on the property itself. So that's real property for 90% um, tax credit on private land. So that's a private land strategy. Um, but we also have our city land leasing initiative. We don't have as many acres as Detroit, but we did an analysis, we probably do, but we, our analysis is showing 20 acres right now are conducive to the requirements our farmers have said they need. Farmers, not gardeners, farmers, meaning that they're growing for production, for sale, okay? Um, so I'm not talking today about community gardeners, I'm talking about farming for trying livelihood. We know that's difficult no matter what your scale and size is. Um, and so we did a land leasing initiative that started several years ago. We have up to 20 acres right now. We have five acres currently leased on public land for $100 a year um, with water rights and then you have soil safety standards as well. Um, so that's sort of the city strategy of land leasing on vacants. You have our private strategy. Um, and we have an urban ag plan. I don't know how many cities have an urban ag plan, but we have one. We also updated our animal regs. Um, and then, you know what changed our landscape were hoop houses. You know, six years ago there was one, and now there's 50. And it's a very affordable way in the city to be able to grow food. Okay, and one other slide, my last slide to go. And this was actually in March. This was in March, the civil unrest was in April, just so you know, so this was well planned a year ahead of time for March, not knowing what was gonna happen in April, of a food and race training. And the purpose of this training was to train leaders, it was to train our food policy advisory committee and organizations on how to talk about food and race. And our food environment map is the exact same map of redlining. I mean, it's, it's exactly, I mean, this has been happening for decades and decades and decades. And the hopes is that can food be that catalyst? Can it be the catalyst to reduce economic, health, and environmental disparities? So this forum was one of the very beginning steps. Um, there needs to be many more conversations from retailers to residents. Um, and then every year we have a food justice forum as well. And that's really looking at the neighborhood's resident perspective on food access. It is their opportunity to guide us as a city on strategies that we need to be looking at and how can we support the neighborhoods. Um, and that brings me to my conclusion, which is 
food for us in Baltimore, we're looking at food in all policies. And we're looking at it from an organizational capacity side of how does government organize and address the policy side of food and how do we lift up and support the nonprofits and academic institutions uh, for food equity. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joan Hopkins, and I'm standing here with my colleague, Stacy Kimmins. Um, we're coming to talk about the Windy City Harvest Corps program. Um, but before I, I go into uh, my story with Windy City Harvest, because there was a bit of a typo in the agenda, um, I was not a youth participant. I haven't been a youth for a very long time now. <laughs> But I did start the uh, Windy City Harvest Corps. I mean, I did start the Windy City Harvest uh, program in 2007. So what is Windy City Harvest? Um, Windy City Harvest is a program of the Chicago Botanic Garden. Um, we offer four training programs. Um, we have the core program, which is a program that I coordinate, and that program is specifically for individuals with a criminal background and, and or veteran status. Um, we offer the apprenticeship program, um, and that program is for anyone who's interested in joining Windy City Harvest. That is a paid program. Um, they pay out of pocket, and that's offered out of the Arturo Velasquez Institute, which is a daily college um, in Chicago. We also offer the youth program, and the youth program is designed for um, ages 15 to 18 um, attending school, CPS in Chicago. So we have uh, four youth farm sites um, around the city of Chicago. And then we also offer the entrepreneur and business, entrepreneur and career program, and that program is designed for anyone who's interested but the benefits are mainly for graduates of the apprenticeship program. So we have 13 sites around the city of Chicago, um, and it's a mixture of youth farm, harvest core sites, and apprenticeship sites. Um, the Arturo Velasquez Institute is located at number seven on our map, and that is the headquarters. That's where um, everyone in Apprenticeship and Corps reports to on a daily basis. Um, in the future, we are getting a food hub. We're finally getting our own home base eight years later. And we're getting that on the west side of Chicago. Um, it's gonna be called the Farm on Ogden. So if you're ever in the city of Chicago, um, maybe this winter, uh, come check us out. We're really excited about it. I started um, Windy City Harvest. I wasn't a youth. I started in 2007 in the pilot program. Uh, when I started Windy City Harvest, it wasn't structured the way it is now. It was um, the idea that the youth from Green Youth Farm can have a way to go, a step up to go, to continue into urban agriculture. Because the question was, what do they do next? Where would the youth go after they've completed if they're really interested in urban agriculture? Um, so Chicago Botanic Garden, um, North Lawndale Employment Network, and CCIL, they uh, joined forces to have a college program. Um, it, it didn't work out that way. Uh, they had to literally pay us. And that, that was perfect for me because I was looking for employment. 
Well, I was, look, I was looking for a career change. Let's not say I was looking for employment because I was working a night shift. So that was ideal for me. You're going to pay me to learn something as interested in this. And at that time, Mayor Daly was our mayor, and he wanted the city to go green. Um, so that was perfect. I got in. I was there every day. I was like, yeah, I can do this. This is perfect for me. This is, this is awesome. I can do this. But everyone in my class, they weren't at all interested because they had criminal backgrounds, and they were actually just in it for the money. Now, true, that was my mindset at first. I'm like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to make some extra money. But once I got into it, I loved every bit about it, and I seen a change in myself. Um, so fast forwarding, eight years later, here I am today. Um, and I don't know, like I'm really passionate about the work that we're doing. And a lot of times I forget that we're like actually making a difference in our communities and we're making a difference in the lives of each individual because it's still work. Um, I'm gonna introduce Stacy. I would like for Stacy to talk a bit about his story and then I'll go back into uh, the outline of Harvest Corps. Okay, good morning, everybody. Good morning. Um, my name is Stacy Kimmons. So to piggyback on what Ms. Hopkins just said, I actually started Harvest Corps three years ago in 2013. Um, that is actually me um, right here with the green shirt. Um, so to piggyback on what she said, a lot of people did do it for the money. I was one of those people who actually loved what I saw. So long story short, it all started one day. There was no overtime. You had to leave it for and we had to stay. And we had to transplant Swiss chart. And I was so mad, I'm like, I'm not getting paid for this. I wanna go home, and I couldn't leave. I'll say about two to three weeks later, I watched the Swiss chart grow to life, you know? And I ended up loving it. It was something I knew that I wanted to stick to. So after Harvest Corps was over with, I chose to go towards work study with Windy City Harvest, um, which went into the next year. The apprenticeship program runs nine months from February of whatever year until October of that same year. Um, and I just grew to love it. After completing the nine-month program, I actually worked, um, well, I interned um, in Chicago at this place called McCormick Place. So if ever you all get a chance to come out to see it, come visit it. Um, I interned there um, for about nine months plus. Um, I went on to actually go into an entrepreneurship program which was on the slide before for three months. After, after going through the nine months, I mean, after going through the uh, uh, entrepreneurship program, you can actually apply for an incubator plot with Windy City Harvest, which is something that I chose to go on to do. Um, I applied and I got approved for it um, for two years. It's a two year contract agreement and I started last year. So I named my business Return to Life Farming. So it came from me basically babying a plant and asking the plant to return back to life to me for me to give it um, to markets such as WIC, which is Women, Infant, and Children. So that was my primary market who I chose to uh, um, grow and sell to and actually Midwest Foods, um, which is my secondary market. And Midwest Foods actually is a wholesale distributor who, um, who we sell to and in return they actually um, give us the comp well, the scraps that they that they no longer use, and we actually compost it. Um, so I went on to do vermin composting, wind rolls, compost, and everything you could think of. Um, and this is something that changed my life because, um, once again, some people don't take it serious, some people do. And to actually piggyback on what she said, I did become very, very full conscious, you know, and it was something that made me turn vegan and made me do a lot of stuff and make a lot of changes in my life um, with this. And um, it is something, Windy City Harvest, they don't promise you success verbally. They do it very, very silently. You know, they give you the key points, you know, if you want to do this, if you want to do this, we support you um, all of the way. And that's something that they did to me. They never once said it verbally, but they did do it physically, you know, and I really appreciate it. Um, and I wouldn't be here today, nor have this business right here, if it wasn't for them. And I'm actually um, in school right now for culinary arts. Um, so hopefully those two go hand in hand and go a long way. So um, now we'll turn it back over to Ms. Hopkins. So um, 
I only have five minutes left, so I'm going to give you a very quick overview. And if you're interested in seeing the slide, um, this is something that I can put in the drop box for you um, later today. Um, so Windy City Harvest Corps is designed for individuals with a criminal background and or veteran status. Um, we are funded by the DFSS, which is the Department of Family and Support Services. Um, we are working with 30 participants a year, so in two cohorts. So I work with different organizations around the city of Chicago. Um, Cook County Boot Camp, also known as the Vocational Rehabilitation Impact Center, um, RTW Veterans Center, Safer Foundation, IDJJ, Department of Juvenile Justice, um, to name a few. And our mission is to train them in urban farming, which gives them transferable skills into back into the working field. Um, I work with other partners, employment partners, to get these individuals placed because the mission is to train them for 14 weeks and send them out into full-time employment. And what better way to do that is to develop a relationship with employers like Midwest Foods, which is a food distributing company. Um, they buy produce from us and they also give us food scraps for composting. And they have agreed to hire from us. Um, Farm Care in Bedford Park, Illinois, they have also agreed to hire from us, our participants. Um, we've had people go on to these two employers specifically and make huge strides in, in their performance there. We have people that are standing as supervisors and they're able to give me feedback on new participants that are going there. Um, some of the skills that these participants are getting is, is basically how to hold a full-time job. I always tell the participants, if you can come into Harvest Corps, complete the 14 weeks, you can go anywhere in the city of Chicago and gain employment and keep your job just by following the Windy City Harvest Standard. Um, and, and I like to remind them that I am a product of the Windy City Harvest Standard. Um, so they're working Monday through Friday. Um, they're in the field Monday through Thursday, getting their hands on training, um, planting, seeding, post-harvest handling and food service, um, weeding, site maintenance, uh, just learning how to uh, put that CBG aesthetic, that Chicago Botanic Garden aesthetic on farming. Um, by us being a program of Chicago Botanic Garden, we have to make sure that all of our sites are pristine. And that's really hard when it comes down to farming, and you think about the urban setting of farming. So this is something that they're gaining. Um, on Fridays, they, that's when they receive their job development portion. Um, with that being said, they're in class receiving Roots of Success, which is a environmental literacy curriculum. Um, while they're in Roots of Success, they are getting resume writing, uh, cover letter writing. They have an opportunity um, every Friday to apply for jobs. And this is something that they're being paying for doing. So this is a model that is really, it, it hasn't been seen in quite some time. So this is a model that, that hasn't been seen. Um, they receive letter of recommendation from their supervisors and myself. Uh, we follow up with them for six months after they've been placed into full-time employment, just ensuring that that relationship with that employer and this participant is a binding relationship. Um, the, each participant receives an IEP, which is an individual employment plan. We're not just placing them into employment that we see fit for them. Uh, we meet with each participant um, to ensure that they have a goal set for themselves. Where do they see themselves after the 14 weeks? Um, it, be it retail, be it food service, be it going back to school, we're gonna apply them on all of their efforts. Um, we have a gentleman who has actually just completed uh, the program of 180 days of completion. And his name is Sean, Sean Sanders. And he's actually developed a relationship with a new employer. This is a employer we had never heard of. It's called Snap Kitchen, uh, located in Chicago. And they love Sean. So now we are able to send more participants. So that's really what Harvest Corps is all about. We're like building relationships with people across the city. And we're ensuring that lives will be changed. 
Um, like I said before, that is my time. Um, if you would like to see the remainder of the slide, because there are more, um, I will send it to you in the drop box. Thank you. Awesome. Thanks to our panel. Um, we can get it now into some questions, some exciting questions. So I think we're going to have some folks and um, pass around a mic here. I'm hoping as a part of our questions, we can really get into some conversations around root causes, right? Um, and some of the structural issues that were alluded to in the opening here as well. So I see two hands over here and um, some mics coming. How many other questions here? Just two right here? One, two, three? Okay. So the first. Um, down here, first row. In the blue tie. Thanks for an uplifting and encouraging panel. And uh, when you spoke about the cover letter and resume writing workshop, I wondered, and, and this is really for all of you, to what degree that you've thought about translating the uh, building that you've done of leaders uh, within urban agriculture and healthy food initiatives and to translate that energy and leadership into new civic leaders, new business leaders, and to give people training and help so that they can become civic leaders and business leaders who may transform other aspects of their communities uh, that we're gonna hear about later on, such as uh, sustainable transportation and law, law enforcement uh, changes. Great, I'm also wondering, is it okay if we take the questions and then have the panel answer since we're a little pressed for time? Is that okay? All right, great. Um, so, uh, wait, wait, um, there was another question right here. <laughs> so you know the answer? No, no, I wanted to make sure you heard that question okay. and then we'll collect it. So my question, first I want to thank you for, that was a fabulous panel and I'm really impressed um, and kind of awestruck by the work that you're doing. Um, and so what, my question is actually a very simple kind of straightforward kind of programmatic question in terms of um, the farming in the environments in which you're farming in terms of the climate environments and how you, have you both in Chicago and in Detroit, are you um, moving beyond kind of thinking about uh, kind of indoor farming and, and um, other, f other mechanisms that will allow people to work full time year round or is this primarily a seasonal uh, endeavor? I think one of the city harvest uh, farms is right near my home and I know there's only, it's only open a couple of months of, of, in the season so I'm just curious what happens in the cold months of which Chicago, there are plenty, <laughs> many, many. many. Yeah, that's um, so it's a very useful. So, so when it comes down to Harvest Core, Harvest Core is um, for 30 participants um, split into two cohorts. Uh, we start in March, which is the spring. Um, we end a cohort in June, and then we start a cohort in June, and then end in September. Uh, reason being, uh, we have to support them through 30 days of full-time employment um, before the end of the year. So before 2017, 30 participants have to have full-time employment without Windy City Harvest. Um, with another employer for 30 days before the end of the year. And then we can track them for the remainder of the year, for the remainder of the 180 days. Um, during our downtime? Uh, well, really in terms of the climate, in terms of the winter months, mm -hmm. are they outside? We do, we do offer um, season extension, and that's, a, that's um, when our 14-week courses, and I didn't get a chance to get into that, but we offer 14-week um, courses. Um, one in particular is season extension. So uh, most of our sites does have hoop houses where we do have staff that will run the hoop houses because we're still trying to meet our sales goal. Each one of our sites have a sales goal. Can I just piggyback on that? So solar passive greenhouses are pretty inexpensive technology that allows you to go from a six month to a 10 month or so growing season. Um, uh, when we get into aquaponics, hydroponics, some of the um, the more um, established indoor growing methods, it takes a lot more capital. Um, and, uh, you know, there's some inequities in our uh, funding model, which prohibits um, a lot of the community that we're working with from having the same access to that kind of capital and infrastructure. Great. And since you all are answering questions, you want to speak to the first question, too, around 
creating opportunities um, for folks as business leaders and things of that nature too. I imagine, Holly, you might have some thoughts too around land that was allocated to folks, um, but if anybody wanna kind of speak to some of that question. I, I can start. So. <laughs> I love that question. We practice open book um, finance at our organization and every single person um, that's um, in our organization, associated with our organization, um, is trained in open book finance and financial literacy. Um, and then people always say, not everybody wants to be an owner. Okay, not, maybe not everybody wants to be an owner, owner but everyone should ta be taught to be an owner and then they should make that decision. Um, and related to civic engagement, I mean, how much of our policy decisions are made by the budget constraints, right? If you don't know how to read a budget, make a budget, you know, work a budget, you're really uh, handcuffed in a lot of ways related to being a civic leader. Great. And in Baltimore, with our land leasing initiative, the requirement is you have to have one year of farming experience um, in order to have a lease with the city. And so one of our farms, Strength to Love 2, um, did not have enough um, experience, um, but their whole purpose was a job training or jobs program for those who've come out of prison um, and vets to be able to grow food in the city. And so they paired up with another for-profit farm and then together they signed a lease with the city. And so that it was really a mentorship between those two organizations and the two farms that then were able to sign a lease and now they're having more farmers go through the system as well. Um, when it comes down to uh, what Windy City Harvest is doing, they offer the business and entrepreneur Ship, which is uh, incubator farming for our participants, where they do sign the two-year lease, like what Stacy was saying, um, and they're able to sail through the Windy City Harvest Market, um, Midwest Foods, uh, WIC, Women, Infant, and Children, and Local Foods. Um, they're also able to find their own outlets where they sell to. Um, some of the incubator farmers, they do have their own outlets that they sell to. Um, and they're also able to uh, use Windy City Harvest insurance as well. So they're working out the kinks on how to get insurance for their own business and things like that. Great. So as we transition to the next question, which is over here on the right, if you can lift your hand so she can see, or whoever has, oh, you have the mic. All right, awesome. <laughs> so um, just a quick question, if you could talk about how you're financed and how do your programs remain financially viable so that if you're relying on grant fundings, are there ways that you're working to move away from having to do that and to be able to sustain yourselves for all of your programs? So one of our programs, and um, this is the Harvest Corps, this is the one that I can speak of. Um, we are funded by the DFSS, Department of Family and Support Services. Um, and for the rest of our grants that we do receive. I'm not exactly sure about those. Um, my director, Kelly Larson, she is here though, and that might be a question that she can answer. Okay. Okay. For us, uh, mission-related earned revenue is key. Um, so our budget right now is uh, between 30% and 40% uh, mission-related earned revenue, and individual gifts from folks in our community, about 20% of the Garden Resource Program members, for example, um, you know, are, are donors to keep growing Detroit. Sometimes it's seven dollars, but hey, you know, it's a, a very high percentage. Um, uh, the remainder of our budget is uh, mostly foundation grants, um, some uh, um, like-minded corporate gifts, um, very few um, uh, government and um, federal dollars because they just make it so easy for us. Uh, we try to avoid them. <laughs> Um, I have a question. Um, I want to congratulate you on doing some really wonderful work, but I just have a, I don't want to rain on the parade, but I fear, I know in Brooklyn, where I was from originally, and in Manhattan, there was some, in the 70s, land that was used, and then, I don't want to say confiscated, but it wasn't zoned agricultural. Right. It was run-down areas, and people just started doing this, and so were these places in Detroit, originally zoned um, industrial, commercial, whatever. And with this um, Detroit Renaissance that's been happening, is there real estate speculators coming in? Are there, if they're gonna build affordable housing, I mean, there's gonna be different people in the community fighting over this same affordable housing, new schools, hospitals, whatever. We went through this in New Brunswick recently, the last 20 years. Um, do, who has title to the land? Is it private? Is it city? I know in Newark there's vast stretches of empty space also. 
I just wonder if you, you do a lot of work and then it gets taken away. Great question. And I also had that question Thank for you. Baltimore Sorry. as well because of the, the leasing too and how long that can last. So if you can, yeah. and this will actually have to be the last question. Sure. Okay. Um, yes, five years ago, you know, I'd be like, well, right, there's risk, but the risk is so low. And the risk is low in some neighborhoods, but it's extremely high now in five mm -hmm. years in some neighborhoods. Um, uh, we have a, 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 a corporate... Um, billionaire, we're being turned into a company town again, uh, Dan Gilbert. Hey, Dan Gilbert. Um, and the, he has this tagline, Opportunity Detroit, and you know, we ask ourselves a lot, opportunity for who? There's, um, mm -hmm. there's a lot of barriers put up in front of um, you know, private gardeners that want to start a business or community gardens that want to you know, own, own and have land tenure. Um, again, we are not creating a facilitative environment that actually says we want places to grow food in every single neighborhood in the city of Detroit in perpetuity. It's just not a value for our city yet. And so we're relegated in a lot of cases to short term, uh, as a short term land use, a transition plan for the city until, you know, we get our two million people back, which will probably never happen. I said, you know, see me again in five years. Um, but um, we are working really, really hard to use the levers um, that we have um, to get everyone who's interested in private ownership, private ownership. Um, it takes us two, three, four years sometimes, but we're successful in a lot of cases. A lot of urban homesteading is happening, mm -hmm. yes. So with urban farms in the city's land leasing, it's a minimum of five year lease. Um, and so when the farmers, and it's really a conversation with the city and the farmer to look at what their long-term plans are um, and if it's a good fit for them. And so they know they have five years and we've analyzed all these sites. And some of the, these sites, if they're going for big development, we're talking 15, 20 years down the line. Um, so when, when we're looking at who gets, what land gets banked in, we're not looking at anything in the six, seven, eight year mark. We're looking at a minimum five year lease, but more likely if anything were to happen, we're talking probably 15, 20 years. Um, but we're also, with the farmers looking at, always looking at what the next step will be, what's the next plan, so they're not by surprise. So if anything needs to happen, they'll have a two year time frame to be able to look at what the next land could be. Um, and so it's intentional of making sure it's five years at minimum with extensions for beyond. Great, um, I really wanna thank the panel. Give, please give them a round of applause. Thank you audience for being so incredible and engaging. I really want to invite people to continue engaging with, sorry to offer you all, and myself too, um, to continue the conversations. I really want to encourage people to really think about some of these structural issues and root causes behind some of the conditions and not just look at the surface, right, but really look at what's happening to cause these inequities, right? Um, and also to caution against pathologizing communities, particularly communities of color, when we're looking at some of these disparities and we're looking at some of these programs, right, and really get back to the structural causes that are really instigating these inequities. So please, again, um, reach out to us. Can I offer you all to? Yep, reach out to us throughout the day. We'd love to continue the conversation. Um, and we're going to actually transition into our keynote um, here today. But again, one last round of applause for the audience. <laughs> Sorry, the panel. <laughs>